Hello, this is Carl Irwin with a, a second installment of the uh, tutorial series uh, that I'm uh, creating here uh, concerning the viewport uh, titled Hacking the Viewport. And uh, in this uh, episode, episode number two, we're going to be looking at uh, creating this uh, space scene which uh, incorporates some of the elements that you uh, can find in the original project if you look back at the uh, trailer to the series and also the uh, uh, first overview episode that uh, you can see that project uh, and uh, this is what we're going to be making so if I uh, hit play here you can see this uh, video move through what we're looking at is a, a nebula and uh, a nebula is if you look on Google uh, a nebula is well it used to it used to be sort of this ambiguous term that we used for any kind of uh, uh element in space that was kind of unknown so galaxies and whatnot were all referred to as nebula but uh now the modern uh and current terminology refers to these uh uh areas in space that are made up of different gases and particles uh so you can see these uh, images of various nebulous and very interesting looking things um some of them you know look like uh, they could be fabricated with smoke simulations uh, some of them are are not quite so dense uh such as this one over here um, you see lots of various, you know, different ideas. In fact, it, you know, when you do a Google search, my guess is that many of these are not even actual uh, nebula images. A lot, some of these are probably uh, fabricated, uh, you know, composited images uh, that are put out there on the Internet. So, you know, obviously something like this. Uh, but we're going to be making something like that, as you can see in our uh, uh, demo video here. So, again, one more time, take a look at this, what this is. And uh, the original project had some elements like this. Now, the purpose of doing this project uh, today <clears throat> is that we're going to um, deal with uh, one of the primary uh, limitations. Again, if we're hacking, uh, we are going to have to address limitations and try to work around them or overcome them uh, in, in an effort to extend the capabilities of the system here. So the largest limitation, as I explained on the overview uh episode was uh, the issue of draw order and alpha transparency that is uh, the ability to look through textures and have uh, opaque areas and then transparent areas and having all of that render properly in the viewport without pressing play on the uh, game engine player so we're going to have to find a way to uh, get all of that transparency to work properly directly in the viewport so uh, let's take a look at the actual project and then we're going to sort of start from scratch and try to build uh, some of this if, if not all of it we'll try to make something uh, relatively close so again this is the viewport uh, actual viewport view and if uh, I play through this you can see that it plays back in real time and uh, you know this is this is everything that's in the scene uh, the only thing that is not dealt with here uh, is the uh, color grading and uh, also um, a couple of uh, post-processing effects uh, re that, that deal with uh, some uh, motion blur and things like that. So uh, there's a couple things that we, again, some limitations we just can't get around in the viewport. Uh, one of those is <clears throat> the ability to blur our images. We can't do that direct. We have to find some other way to deal with that. Uh, and uh, that would include motion blur as well. So we have to find another way, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about that. But the goal here, again, is to get as much in the viewport as possible, because if we can render as much as possible in the viewport, it cuts down on our rendering time, and it will cut down on our post-processing uh, list, uh, things that we need to do in post-processing. So let's just quickly look at what's in the scene, and then we'll try to put it together. So if I pull out of a camera view, you can see that we have our cameras back here, uh, and we see all these smoky kinds of things. It actually looks pretty interesting, even from uh, outside of the camera view. There's a lot of three-dimensional space there, but if I, <clears throat> uh, rather volumetric looking three-dimensional effects, but if I start to rotate the camera, you can start to see the two-dimensional uh, um, aspect of these different elements. So you can see that uh, these are really just several cards uh, different billboard type images that uh, have some sort of alpha transparency. You can see as I come around behind the back, the uh, alpha transparency fails, uh, and that is because of the issue of draw order. Okay, uh, so let me go back around to the front here. 
back to the camera. <coughs> so one more time we'll uh, play this back and we'll uh, try to put this together. Okay, so this is what we're going to be making, something like this. Uh, let's start a new uh, project. Let me save this one first, and we'll open up a brand new project starting from scratch. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the... Uh, actually, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our uh, render settings here, our, just our shading settings, and we're going to set it from multi-texture, which is the default, to GLSL, which is going to give us OpenGL, all of the capabilities of, uh, of OpenGL uh, that Blender has in the viewport, uh, which... Uh, among those capabilities are some of these issues that I talked about with texturing, materials, uh, transparency, and uh, most importantly, what we may look at later on, uh, this uh, will enable the ability to play back video files frame by frame uh, in real time uh, within, on, on a, uh, in a flat image plane. And that is something that we may want to be able to do in the future. So GLSL, we want to enable that. Also be aware of the uh, display mode only render. We're going to be switching back and forth uh, to that quite a bit as we put this together. So the first thing that we're going to do now is uh, go to the uh, front view and then we will align our camera, our active camera, to this view. And again, I'm working on a laptop so I don't have a number pad on here. Uh, we're going to grab this camera and move it up on the uh, z-axis. So you don't have to do this. In fact, you could keep this on the top view looking down, but I like to do this because having that plane in there just gives us some uh, orientation within our scene. Uh, the, the feeling that we're actually looking down a corridor or away from the camera on, uh, on an axis and that we have this uh, left and right x-axis and an up and down uh, axis. So uh, it just gives us a little bit of reference as we're moving around the scene. So I like to do this even though we don't really have to for what we're doing. Uh, I'm also going to uh, delete our light. We're not going to need that light in particular. We may use a light later on, but we don't need that. We'll delete the default cube. We're not going to need any of those things. Uh, now, uh, before we go any further, I need to explain that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be importing a number of textures. So if we look here, I have a few textures that I've already set aside, and I'll open up an Im image viewer here and we'll look at them. So uh, a website that all of you should have a membership to and an account in is cgtextures.com cgtextures.com. Uh, if you go there, uh, make an account, it's free, and what you can do is download uh, hundreds and hundreds of textures at high resolution that you can use for your projects. These textures are an open license so that you can use them in anything that you do. Uh, it's a very, very a wonderful resource for uh, open sourcers like myself and probably like many of you. Uh, and even if you're not using Blender, even if you're using a compositor, if you're using a, a proprietary compositor like Nuke or After Effects or one of the others out there, uh, or hit film or something like that. Um, these are invaluable to uh, uh, our, our the projects that we make and that we work on uh, because they are free and they're high resolution. So uh, these uh, images are from CG Textures. So this is the first one that I got. This is another one that I got, uh, these two sky textures. And I also grabbed this one. There are hundreds of uh, smoke textures. And uh, I pulled this one off of the website. And uh, what I did is I altered this. Uh, it is actually kind of a smoky... Uh, kind of stream and this would actually extend all the way down to the bottom of the frame so you know like a candle that's been blown out or something like that and I brought this into a photo editor and I just uh, painted out the bottom stream so I just kind of have this cloud of wispy smoke okay and again there's hundreds of textures just like this on CG textures and uh, uh, we're only going to need to use this one but you can actually download many many different types of different elements and uh, and use them for what we're going to be doing and then uh, uh, in addition to these three textures that I got from CG Textures. I also have uh, this texture which I just created in GIMP. Uh, and what I did is I just put a couple of dots in the screen on a black uh, uh, background. And I have uh, three different colors in here. I did uh, uh, red, green, uh, and blue, and white. And uh, this is going to be used for a star field. And uh, notice that there's not a lot of stars on here. Uh, and keep in mind that stars, the reason why I'm using different colors is that stars in space are not always... Uh, 
points of light. They appear to be points of light, but some of them are reflected objects, such as planets and even some of these nebula, uh, things that are way out there in space that uh, are so far away, they just appear of, as uh, uh, spots in space. And if you look very closely at some NASA imagery, you'll notice that some of these stars, because they're not all uh, you know, balls of burning gas, uh, because some of them are reflected, they have color. Some of them have some color. So uh, in order to be authentic and present the right kind of look, uh, you want to use some different colors when creating a little star field. So, um, And also, you don't want to use a lot of points when making an image like this. I'm not going to go through the process of making it. You can find, you know, uh, your own way to do this. But uh, 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 you want to make sure you don't put a lot on there because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using this in three-dimensional space and the composite of various uh, uh, instances of this star field image is going to add up to quite a few stars very quickly so you want to be kind of sparse uh, and very random in it. I will say that what I did is I put some dots in there and then what I did is I copied the image and then I uh, pasted it and I slid it off frame so that the edge of it is in the middle and I did this a number of times so that uh, what I did was I ended up taking the edge of my original image and I ended up replacing it with the interior uh, sections of the original, okay? And uh, hopefully that makes sense to you, but the reason why I did that is because as you make an image, a single plane, we have a tendency to not be as random as we think that we are, and uh, you may tend to put more objects near the frame or too many objects in the center and avoid the uh, frame edges, and you want it to be absolutely even. So again, I made my original image, and I copied it, I slid it over, I pasted it on, and I did this a few times until I came up with something truly random, because uh, we're going to uh, use this in an array, and when we make an array, we don't want to notice uh, uh, clear patterns in our array. We don't want to see... Um, uh, places where there's a big uh, condensation or a big uh, um, gathering of stars in any one spot. We want it to be truly random. Okay, So these are the images that we're going to be using now. Um, another thing that I did before we get into the project <coughs> excuse me, is we uh, I took uh, this image and I made a new image. Um, I changed it. I altered it. I took the um, uh, saturation out of it, quite a bit of it, and I created kind of this gradient to black all the way around the edge, and uh, I took the, uh, 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 what am I talking about here? I took the saturation and uh, uh, I, I just took all the levels way down. I took the luminance out, uh, so the contrast is taken away, so that I came up with something like this, okay? And uh, we're going to use it for a subtle effect. I not only did it with this image, but I also did it with uh, the uh, Ignore This Planet. Uh, uh, this is something that I did, too, thinking I might use it. I decided not to, uh, but uh, this is something we'll probably look at in another a tutorial down the line, a way to make two-dimensional planets. You don't always need to have three-dimensional objects for uh, three-dimensional objects when compositing. So uh, Oftentimes your three-dimensional objects can actually be two-dimensional cards. So this is a project that we'll do in GIMP probably later on. Um, I did this. So with this uh, other image that I had, I, I did the same kind of thing. I took the contrast and saturation out. I applied a gradient to black all the way around the edge so that I kind of mask out this uh, central part uh, that we're going to use. Okay. So again, the uh, images that we're using in the end is this one, uh, this one here, and uh, this uh, smoke wisp plus the uh, image that I created for the star field. And those are the elements that we are going to use. So let's go to the, uh, uh, let's go back to Blender here and uh, get to it. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start importing some images and applying uh, some material settings to them. Uh, so let's uh, grab uh, the most background image. Now, as we do this, um, uh, you need to make sure that you enable a important add-on, and, and I'm actually surprised that this is not on by default. I don't believe that it is. Maybe it is, and I've, I've missed this, but um, if you go to your add-ons and type in image uh, as planes, this one right here, import, export, import images as planes, you want to make sure that that is checked. This is a vital add-on, and uh, really ought to be a default uh, set as default uh, on the install. I'm not sure that it is right now. I think that it's something you'll have to enable. But it's something that you're going to want to use. We can find this here uh, in the um, file import uh, 
drop down and you see here images is plain so I'll click on that it will take me to a browser and I'm going to go to my uh, folder where I have my textures and uh, if you click on this button right here it will change your display mode so that you can see the thumbnails of what we're doing uh, I'm gonna start with uh, this one right here uh, so this background this will be our furthest background image and uh, I want to change some settings I want to make sure that my settings are set to shadeless um, you can use this or not. This doesn't really have any alpha transparency on it. By uh, you know, I automatically click that just so that it's available all the time. Um, if it doesn't have alpha transparency, then it won't matter. But if it does, then it'll be enabled. And you want to make sure that you're set to Z transparency for transparent images. Anything that has alpha transparency enabled on it. I think by default it's on mask. Okay, so uh, these three things you want to have checked, and then we'll import the image. And uh, right away we will uh, scale it up. I'm going to rotate it on the x-axis 90 degrees so it's facing the camera. Then I'm going to come down here to my uh, display, uh, uh, my shading uh, selector here, viewport shading selector, and I'm going to set it to texture. So now I can see my image uh, in real time uh, through the OpenGL uh, render engine. Uh, before I go any further, I'm going to go over to my world settings, and I'm going to click on the horizon. I'm going to set my horizon color uh, all the way to black. Now, uh, I've learned that in projects, you never want to have absolute all black, and you never want to have absolute all white uh, in the end. However, we're going to deal with that in our, in our uh, color grading when we get to the end of all of this. If uh, you're not going to do any kind of post-process or video sequence editor OpenGL uh, color grading, you want to make sure that when you use background colors, you never use the uh, absolute black, but maybe bump this up just one notch uh, so that you get uh, actually a slightly off black. Okay, The white is not so much of a big deal, but the black can be when you uh, start to render out uh, to video uh, with compressed settings. It can really make your out uh, your output file look kind of crummy and uh, uh, really dark and white's blown out and all that kind of thing. So uh, just you want to decrease your contrast as much as you can. Okay, so we have our first image, and uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to move it uh, back on the y-axis way back, and you'll see that I'll get to a point where it disappears. And uh, that is a problem because we want to be able to see way into the back here. Now what we need to do is we need to set our clipping on our camera. So if I go over to my uh, camera, select the camera and go to the camera settings, you see here that it has a setting for clipping, start point one and 100. We're just going to throw that way up to a uh, thousand. Okay, it's not really going to be relevant for what we're doing. So uh, this can be really, really high. It's not going to slow us down at all uh, in, in terms of the space that we're going to be using. Now if I go back to my camera, I can now see my uh, my plane way back there in the distance, and uh, it is, it is uh, in view. Okay, so let me select my image again, and I'm going to scale it way up. I'm going to try to fill the frame here uh, somewhat. So we'll get it probably about that big. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the uh, render uh, settings here. Right now we're on the internal render. We're never going to use cycles in this tutorial. Uh, and I'm going to set it to Blender Game, and that's because the game engine gives us some special material settings that we need to use. Now, uh, I've done this on other tutorials. Uh, we're going to change the blend mode for this material to an add blend mode. Now this setting is not in the Blender internal render engine uh, material settings and uh, someone once mentioned on a tutorial that I did uh, in the comments that that is strange. Why in the world would that be? And uh, it's not strange. It's not strange at all. The reason why it's in here and it's not in the internal render is because this has no effect in the internal render output. Uh, this has an effect for making games, for using the game engine. So that's why it, it's in the game engine only, and it's not in the internal render engine. Now, what we're doing is we are, as I said, hacking the viewport. We're going to be using things in an un uh, settings in an unorthodox way. Uh, so we're going to borrow this setting because it does show up in the GLSL viewport even when we're in the internal render settings okay and we're going to be switching back to the internal render engine because it has material settings that we need to use from there as well okay so back and forth uh, we'll be switching um, and uh, you know that's not a problem uh, it's you know look at it this way it's not something we have to do it's something that we can do it's something that we're able to do okay now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the uh, texture settings for this material and uh, we're going to slide down and we're going to find uh, the blend mode for the texture and I'm going to set it to 
multiply. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the luminance of that image and it's going to multiply the underlying color on the material. And if I go to this material, the underlying color is this diffuse color. I'm going to bump the intensity all the way up to 1. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to set it to kind of, uh, maybe kind of a purpley type color, uh, somewhere around here. And uh, I can actually affect its uh, uh, luminance by uh, changing the brightness of the color. I'm going to kind of bring it down here, maybe to a mid-tone around, uh, around here. Okay. Now if I hit only render at this point, you'll see what's happening. I have this image in the background that is transparent, and it is adding... Uh, via the open the uh, game engine blend mode add this uh, image using this color to the black background okay so this is a transparent image that is being added composited via the add blend mode to our black world background okay I'm actually going to turn this down a little bit more because it's a little bright and uh, in the end this is going to be a pretty subtle effect that we're going to have here okay so take it down to about there all right. Now, uh, let me stop here for a moment and address uh, one thing. Give me one second as I take a quick uh, drink. Um, throat gets dry when you talk like this. Um, one thing that I mentioned in the uh, overview is that the draw order and alpha transparency issue is a big one. <coughs> we need to th create our scenes from foreground to background because that's how the draw order works if we create from the background to the foreground we will have an issue with transparency and we've already broken uh, the basic rule of that um, restriction uh, I put my background uh, image in first that's a big no-no um, so I'm gonna teach you a way to get around that um, now I'm not aware of any kind of calibration setting in blender that will automatically set the draw order to work from the camera to the background maybe there is such a setting I don't know maybe something associated with the out, uh, outliner I've never seen anything like it uh, and to my knowledge that doesn't exist now most other compositors proprietary compositors they deal with this problem by having such settings uh, having the ability to uh, calibrate the OpenGL. Some of them do it on the fly, and they change the draw order constantly on the fly, depending on where the camera view is at. Others uh, might have the ability to change that once things are in the scene. Uh, Blender, I don't believe, has any setting like that. Now, if I am wrong, please, please, please point it out in the comments section, and I will make sure that it gets uh, put into the description of this tutorial so that others can find it quickly, okay? Or I can put a bubble up on, uh, you know, on the YouTube uh, uh, interface so that people can see that setting. But there is no such setting, so we're going to have to find a way to reset the draw order, and I have, in fact, discovered a way to do that. Uh, it has to do with organization and parenting. Uh, we need to be hyper-organized as we put this together. More organized than you would need to be in any other compositing kind of situation. Okay, So what we're going to do in the interest of organization is I'm going to label this. I'm going to um, uh, change this name to Nebula. And at the beginning of it, I'm going to put the letter Z. Uh, Z Nebula. I'm going to use this letter to indicate the the depth from the camera. So letters A uh, and such at the beginning of the alphabet being closest to the camera. Letter Z, X, Y, Z uh, <coughs> being images that are furthest away. And uh, we can augment this. Let's say if I put something behind this later on, I can put Z, Z and uh, just count up the Z's or Z1, Z2, or something like that. But we want to be able to look in our outliner and see exactly where the images are supposed to be in relationship to everything else in the scene in terms of depth. Uh, and I can always go back and change this if I want to move my element somewhere else. Okay, That will help us when we need to recalibrate our draw order later on in the project. Okay, So be organized. Uh, that is our first hack, uh, is to be organized. Okay, so... Let's deal with this. Next image. Let's uh, open up something else. So we'll go to the uh, import images plane settings again. And uh, we'll grab our star field at this time. So we'll grab onto that. You can see that our import settings are different than they were before. And that's because we're in the game engine. So you see how this is going to matter that we switch back and forth. So just to be sure, by default, the settings that you used the last time should be the same on the second, third, and, and uh, sequential times after that. Uh, but you always want to check and make sure. So we're going to import this 
image is a plane. And uh, I'm just going to get out of the only, uh, only render mode so we can see a little bit better. We'll hit uh, R uh, on the x-axis, rotate on the x 90 degrees, so we're facing the camera. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And this is uh, a little too small for our scene. We're not going to want to make it too big. If we make this too big, then we start to see that these are just painted points. And some of them are cut off, and it doesn't look very good. Uh, we see kind of the texture of the uh, painting that was uh, done uh, in order to create this image. So what I am going to do is I'm going to apply a modifier. We'll go to the modifier stack. We're going to add an array. And uh, we'll back up here from view. And we'll just uh, make this array uh, three wide. And uh, I'm going to add another array modifier. And uh, we're going to uh, change it from the x-axis, put the zero. And we're going to add the y-axis one. And uh, we will make an array of probably three is enough, but we'll do four to be on the safe side. Okay. Uh, again, we're not going to have a lot of uh, difficult, complex geometry in here, so it doesn't matter that this got really big here with this uh, modifier. I'm going to apply it now, uh, both of these modifiers, uh, because we're settled on this uh, new image. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I want to get my point into the center, my uh, anchor point on this object. So I'll go to the object settings and I'll click on transform and I'll go, uh, I'll click on origin to geometry and it puts the origin now in the center. So as I move it around the scene, uh, I can grab onto it from the centermost point. I'm going to uh, move out of my uh, view here. I'm going to slide this thing back uh, in front of the backmost plane. I'm going to give quite a bit of distance out here though. Uh, you can see we've already, we're covering a lot of ground here and our camera's not going to be moving that far. So we do want to be quite a bit further in front of this image. And uh, I'll go back to my camera view. We want to scale this up so that it fills our frame and then some, just a little bit bigger. And uh, if I click on my camera, I can see it. I want to click on my um, let me go to my camera settings real quick and make sure it's all set up all the way to 100. It's on high definition, 1080p. I'm just going to render one frame here and just kind of see what the output uh, looks like. So just to make sure that our stars don't look uh, too painted. And I think we're good. I think we're okay with uh, this right now. So we'll go back to the 3D viewport. And I'm going to select my star field and we're going to go back to the Blender game engine. And again, this is just kind of an uh, automatic response for me. Uh, once you understand what we're doing here, you'll do this automatically as well. We want to set the add uh, mode to, or add the blend mode to add, just like we did before. And uh, I want to go to the texture settings, and we're going to, s actually we're going to leave that alone because it already has its own color in it. We don't need to set that to multiply. And you can see that right now we can see through to the background image. If I hit only render, we can see through to the background image. And uh, uh, that's that's a good thing. And then when we click on the camera, uh-oh, uh-oh, we got a problem. We can't see the background image anymore. That's because this was created outside of the draw order. We went from the background to the foreground. Okay, so this is a this is a problem. We're gonna have to deal with that. We're gonna want to get this uh, transparency to work in the other direction. Okay, so we'll we'll do that in a moment. Uh, but first, before I do that, I'm just going to click on the uh, star field, uh, and I'm going to change the name, and I'm going to leave it as star field, and I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put the letter Y on it. So we have Z in the background, Y in front of that. And I'm going to go back to my camera view, and I'll turn off only render again. We're going to import another image, file, uh, import images as planes. And uh, I'm going to import this image right here. Again, just check our settings, make sure it's shadeless. Yes, good to go. Import. We'll give it a second. We'll hit rotate on the x-axis, 90, a lot of repetition, scale it up. And uh, I'm going to go to the uh, game engine settings again. Back and forth we go. So someone might look at this and say, "Wow, this is really a pain in the neck." Remember, we're hacking the viewport. Okay, always tell yourself that we're trying. We're going to get this to work uh, when otherwise it wouldn't work. Okay, so just remember that there's a there's a goal to this, and it's well worth uh, our effort uh, jumping back and forth here. I'm going to uh, on this one. I'm going to set the blend mode to multiply uh, as I did on the background image. We'll go back to the uh, material color, uh, set the intensity all the way up to one. And uh, we're going to put this more kind of on a uh, bluish type color. Uh, maybe a little less purpley in the background. And I'm going to set it all the way up to the top, okay, in terms of luminance. And we're going to slide this back. 
uh, so that it's a little ways away, if you can see in here, uh, from our star field plane back here. We want it to be kind of sitting a little bit in front of that so that we get a little bit of parallax motion. Okay. You can kind of see where my line, as I move this, if you see here where my line cuts out, that's because it runs into that transparency, so I can see my depth uh, that way. So I'll put it right about here, and we'll go back to the camera view, and we'll scale this guy up so that it fills the frame. And uh, we'll move it uh, down, slightly down on the uh, z-axis here, okay? And uh, we'll call this uh, nebula and we'll call it X. Okay, and uh, let's go to, uh, let's, let's bring in another uh, uh, star field, but we don't have to bring it in. What I can do is we can click on our star field in the back, our Y star field. I'm just going to click on it. I'm going to hit uh, Shift D to duplicate, hit Escape. Then we'll drag it on the uh, Y axis in front of the second nebula. We'll move it out here a ways. Okay. And we come back to the camera viewport. Now, we do not want to have this in the same position as the other star field. There's a few things that we can do. I can slide this over so that we're getting a different field of stars, or I can uh, do a combination of things. I can rotate this on the Y axis uh, so that it doesn't line up with the stars behind it and maybe even slide it out of uh, view in a couple of different uh, directions. So that now we're using some different stars here. Uh, I might want to find a more uh, slightly more concentrated part uh, just so that we are, are not cutting out most of our stars from the scene here. So maybe right about here. Okay. So now we've got uh, two star fields, but this one is in a different location from everything else. It's actually in front of the X. So we will uh, click on this name here, and uh, I'm going to put uh, the letter W in front of it. Okay. And now we have uh, these images in line. Right? We've got a couple of star fields. We've got a couple of uh, very, very faint nebula images, and none of the draw order works right. If we go back to the camera and click on the camera, you can see that none of the alpha transparency is working properly. Let's fix it now, okay? So to this point, we haven't used true tra alpha transparency. None of these have any alpha transparent uh, capability. What we have used is the add blend mode from the game engine. Now, in any version of transparency, and there's actually several versions of transparency, there's the alpha transparent version, there is the uh, game engine uh, add mode uh, version, there's also the x-ray transparency version, and uh, we'll get to that later on. There's a secondary uh, type of transparency that can be added as well uh, from the uh, uh, Blender render engine here, internal render engine, if we go back to that. Uh, that you can see uh, on a, a, an object in the uh, object settings. You can see x-ray and there's another transparency. All of these things uh, have their kind of own category unto their own, unto themselves in terms of transparency. So far we've only used one type. We've only used the add blend mode type of alpha transparency. Okay, So we're dealing with all images with the same kind of properties. Um, that's going to be important later on because we're going to add other images that will have different types of transparency. What I want to do here is uh, recalibrate this. So the way we're going to do it is I'm going to add uh, a, we can use either the create uh, toolbar up here or we can use the add toolbar down here. It doesn't really matter. It does the same thing. We're going to add an empty, plain axis empty. And I'm going to call this draw order. I'm going to use this for one purpose, and that is to make sure that all of my images in my scene are in the proper jaw order. That's the only purpose that this empty is going to serve in the entire project. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to parent all of these to my draw order empty. So I just drag and drop them in there, and then I can uh, open up the outliner for the draw order. And what I want to do is I'm going to unparent them one at a time, and I'm going to work my my way from the foreground to the background. So I will start with W. I'm going to bring it out, then I'll go to X, then I'll pull out Y, and then I'll pull out Z. And what this has done is, in effect, this has regenerated uh, these objects as if they've been newly created into the scene. Because they have been newly created into the scene. They were part of another world. They were part of the draw order 
uh, object world. And now they have been replaced back into the scene and they've been recreated and regenerated. Um, so one way to do this uh, could have been to duplicate it and delete the old one, right, in the proper draw order. Uh, but this is much better because we don't have to duplicate and delete and change names and all this kind of stuff. We can just go through this quick calibration process and get things back into the draw order. Now check this out. If I go back to my camera view and I click on the camera, look, all of my alpha transparency is operating properly now. Uh, and if I click on the only render, we already have something that starts to look like a space scene. I can see kind of these cloud-like outlines in the background and this uh, volumetric looking imagery. And even if I take my camera right now and I move it on the Y space forward, you can see that I get parallax motion because these star systems, uh, image planes, are sitting in three-dimensional space. Okay, So uh, we've we fixed it. We've recalibrated it. Now this is going to be important in the future uh, because we're going to have to do this a few more times. Now I don't want to do this every time with these images, so I'm going to make a decision right now. I decide now that all of these planes, these four image planes, are good to go, they're in the proper order, and nothing else is going to really interfere with them using the same kind of blending mode. Okay, Nothing else will be uh, among them. Everything else that I add will either be fully in front of these or fully behind all of them, but nothing will be among them Okay, using the same blending mode. Okay, so because I'm making that decision, I can do something now. I can actually parent all of these to an object uh, and then make that uh, kind of a big collective group of alpha transparent images that can be dealt with all together when recalibrating the draw order. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to add another uh, empty here, plain axis, and I'm going to name this uh, Starfield. Okay, and this will. Uh, kind of encompass the star field and all in these two nebula uh, kind of images here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, uh, empty and just so that it has better geographic place in, placement, I'll slide it back kind of to the uh, in, interior of this uh, grouping here. Okay, And uh, I'm going to go to my camera view just so you can see it and I'm going to parent these objects now to the star field empty. Now, here's a problem. When we unparent from our draw order calibrator, we need to do it from foreground to background. When we parent to another object in order to maintain transparency, we work in reverse. Okay, uh, this is my recollection. I think I'm right about this, and so let me let me test it out here. But we need to go the other direction. So if you understand these idiosyncrasies, you can do this very quickly and efficiently. Okay, so again, the next hack is that we're going to group these together. We're going to parent them to one object so that that one object can be dealt with when we deal with draw order down the road. Okay, we're not having to recalibrate all these images. So I'm going to start from the background first. I'm going to parent a Z Nebula to Starfield. I'm going to parent Y starfield to starfield. I'm going to parent the X, and I'm going to parent the W. Okay. So now if I go to my camera, you can see all of my alpha transparency has remained. Now if you do this out of order, uh, just to uh, demonstrate to you, uh, let me let me put these out, out here back again. So we're going to start foreground, bring them back in so we can see W, X, Y, Z. If I go in the wrong order and I go from foreground to background parenting, Look what happened. Already you can see that this isn't going to work. W, X, Y, Z. You see how nothing is, nothing's working now. I'm stuck with my foreground alpha transparency. You see, you see the problem. Now this can be frustrating, but I have done the legwork for you and I have, sh I have found out, uh, that there's a way to get around this. There is a hack to this. Okay. So W, X, Y, Z. We're in the proper draw order. And to parent back in, we go in reverse, Z, Y, X, W. Okay, so all of that to describe a very simple issue uh, in dealing with draw order. Okay, so now <clears throat> we're good to go. All of those are parented together. I can take this entire empty of objects and deal with them when I recalibrate jaw order with other uh, categories of objects in the scene later on. So I've turned four objects essentially into one. Okay, let's keep going. We're going to import another image as a plane. So we'll select another one, and uh, we're going to take this uh, smoke image here, this wisp, and uh, all the settings are the same. Import the image as a plane. <clears throat> I'm going to rotate this again on the 
x-axis 90 degrees. We're going to scale it up. And again, we're going to use the same, uh, same kind of mode. This doesn't have any alpha transparency in it, so I'm going to go to the game engine. And we're going to set it to add. Because it's a black and white image, we can use the white uh, to multiply the color. So if you follow me, I'm just doing the same things I did for some of the other images. Turn our intensity up. A lot of repetition here. Uh, and uh, we'll use a kind of a more of a pinky color here for this one. And uh, we'll scale it up quite a bit. Turn on my only render so I can see here. Now again, this is out of draw order. I just put it in front of all of the other images in the scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to recalibrate that when I'm uh, done with this. So we'll scale it up. I'm going to move it back so it is in my scene, uh, not too close to the very front plane here. Okay, about just as equidistant away. Okay, go back to the view, camera view, and I uh, will scale this down a little bit. It's a little bit big. I'm going to slide this one over here to the right, uh, rotate it maybe on the uh, y axis. Okay, and uh, we'll call this. Um, We'll call this uh, smoke. Uh, we'll call it X. Oops, rather X smoke. Okay, I'm going to duplicate it. Shift D to duplicate. I'm going to slide it over, and you can see that we have alpha transparency problems. Now, between these two, I can move the second one that I created slightly back behind the first one, so that now, uh, as I if I select on my camera, you can see the draw order is working between these two. Okay, I'm going to deal with these two images separate from my background star field. Okay, my star field images are all set. I'm not going to tinker around with them anymore. I'm going to work on kind of a mid ground of images here. So I'll select uh, X Smoke 1. I'm going to change the name uh, to uh, Y because this one is behind the other one. And I uh, will scale it up a little bit, rotate it uh, on the Y axis around, and uh, we'll set this kind of in a different location. Maybe I'll scale it down just a little bit from there. Okay, and maybe rotate it so it's not quite so symmetrical. And uh, now if I click on my camera you can see these two images in there. Alright, so what I'll do is I'll take these two images and I'm going to place them uh, together in another empty. Alright, so let me just uh, click on this so I can see a bit better. We'll add another empty plane axis, and I'll slide this one back kind of to where these uh, images are at, and uh, we'll call this empty smoke, uh, and I might actually want to do this, I think it'll be self-explanatory, I was going to put a letter on that so we can keep track of it, uh, foreground and background, but I don't think we're going to have that many to, to get too confused. I'm going to parent these objects to the smoke empty. Remember I want to start foreground to background to keep the draw order proper. So I click on X and I drag X in, then I drag Y in, and now I have two objects. I have smoke and star field that are in the wrong draw order. So if I go back to my camera you can see the alpha transparency isn't working right. So I'm going to recalibrate these. I will uh, drag both of them into my draw or order calibration, and I will bring them out from foreground to background, which is smoke first, followed by star field second. And uh, I should, let me see here, and we should be able to see this working, but you see that there's a discrepancy in the alpha transparency here. So let me let me look at my smoke layer real quick. My why smoke may need to move back. Let me click on my X smoke. Let me bring these back out here again. X, Y. I may have done this wrong. I think I wanted to go Y first into smoke, X second into smoke, and click on the camera. I think we're good now. Okay. So I, I put those in in reverse in the wrong order. In fact, we still have some draw order issues because now that I've done that, uh, my draw order is, is off again between the two objects. So we'll do this one more time. So foreground first, background second, 
and now we're golden. Okay, so uh, again, there's a logic to it that uh, you want to understand. All right, so now uh, if I were to render, if I click on only render, click on camera, I should be able to see everything in my final output exactly as it, it, it should be. So we're seeing our different elements in there. Background element, middle element, stars. Uh, we can check this by taking our camera and moving it through Y space to see if we're getting parallax motion. And we seem to be getting parallax motion on everything. Control Z to undo. And uh, let's add something else into the scene. So we've got uh, two different groupings of objects. Both of them are using, all of them are using the add blend mode. Let's try something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to go to my smoke layer. I'm going to duplicate uh, one of these again. Uh, shift duplicate, shift D. Uh, and I'm going to bring it outside, unparent it. And I'm going to uh, rename this. I'm going to rename this uh, 3D. Uh, smoke. Okay. All of these are two-dimensional images set in three-dimensional space. We need something that's actually three-dimensional. Okay. Uh, and actually, what I'm going to do right now, just to kind of get get a little bit more space in here, I'm going to take my smoke uh, grouping and I'm going to move them back a little bit. If I go to my camera view, uh, I can uh, enlarge that whole grouping now. So you see that now that we've parented things together, we can deal with our elements. We're kind of making a separate composite here that we can deal with all together. I'm going to go to my uh, new smoke element, 3D smoke, and we're going to add a couple of... Um, uh, let me come out of my only render display here. We're going to add uh, a modifier. I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier. We're going to bump it up to... Five or six. Five is probably good. I'm going to click on Simple, so it's just subdividing the plane. And then I'm going to add another modifier. We're going to add a Displacement modifier. And uh, by default, the Displacement modifier, when we click on New Texture, adds an Image Texture, which we don't have one in there. So we need to click on the Texture slot. And we want to change that from Image to uh, Cloud, Clouds. And you can see what it does. It adds this kind of de deformed uh, look on it. Now I want to make my deformations a little bit bigger and more general. So I'm going to go to the cloud uh, texture. I'm going to enlarge it quite a bit until I find something kind of interesting. So maybe right there, 0.75. And I'm going to keep my depth low uh, because I don't. I want it kind of blotchy. So it gives us these really big, broad waves. Then I'm going to go to the uh, modifier itself, and I'm going to uh, change the strength. To, let's change it to three. Let's change it to four. Let's go even bigger. Uh, and that's that's pretty big. Let's go now to our camera view. Now you're going to notice something before I do that. See how it's intersecting with my other images? Now I've already talked about draw order problems. This can't work. Okay, this can't work with uh, the draw order issue unless we use a little known. Um, uh, underused setting in the uh, object settings that will allow us to buck this draw order problem okay when using the add blend mode uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the camera view we'll look at our uh, texture here and uh, I'm going to click on only render so I can kind of see where I'm placing it I'm going to rotate it on the uh, y-axis and kind of find a different alignment here I think I might, uh, actually I'll set it down here, so it's kind of pointing up, rotate on the y-axis a little bit, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change the material settings a little bit. We're going to go to the object settings, and under the object settings, uh, we'll find this under display. There's this setting called X-ray, another one called transparency. We're going to click on X-ray. Now what X-ray does is it tells uh, the render engine that anywhere that this object is, it will always show through every other object in the scene, even if it's a solid object. Okay, so by clicking X-ray, this object will show through every other object in the scene, even if it's a solid object. And because of that, it will buck 
our um, draw order issue with transparency. So this can actually sit in three-dimensional space and intersect with these other planes, and it won't matter. Okay. So let me go back to the camera view, and you'll see if I click on the camera and I move the camera forward on the y-axis, we have three-dimensional volumetric effects going on here because one of these smoke planes is moving forward in three-dimensional space. Now, they're all using kind of the same color, so I want to change this one a little bit. I'm going to click on my 3D smoke. I'm going to go to the material settings. <coughs> and on the uh, material, I'm going to click on this number three because it means that three different objects are using the same material. I want this to be assigned its own material. So now I can change my color. I'm going to make this one more blue. Uh, like that. And I'm actually going to go to my X and Y smoke, and I'm going to take that color, and I'm going to bring down the um, uh, darkness a little bit, so it's not quite so overwhelming in the scene. Okay. So now if I click on my camera, and I move my camera forward in uh, Y space, we can see this relationship change a little bit. A little bit more definition there and difference. Okay. Um, now this isn't, you know, you want to spend some time working at this and making it absolutely perfect, but you can see how this is getting put together. Lots of little subtle uh, things going on here, little subtle details to make this work together. Uh, let's add something else. I think we're done with all of our nebula. Let's add, um, let's add to the scene a, a light of some sort. Okay, so I've released a lens flare pack called GL Flares, and I also released another one called GL Flares 2. Uh, very innovative names there. They are on uh, blendswap.com, so if you get an account set up and search for GL Flares and GL Flares 2, you can find these packages and download them. They have a completely open license. You can do whatever you want with them. You can use them. You don't have to give me any kind of credit. I'm happy uh, to share uh, that with you. Um, if you download those, uh, you don't need to use the rig itself, uh, lens flare rig, although the rig is very powerful. In fact, we can't even use that rig in this situation. Uh, but what you can use is some of the elements from it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import another images plane. We'll go to object, uh, rather, uh, sorry, file, uh, import images planes. I'm going to navigate real quick to that um, uh, my folder for GL Flares 2. And I'm going to select one of these flares here. So I'll select uh, this one called Streak 8. And uh, just to make sure my settings are still proper. They should be, but just to make sure. And uh, what I'm going to do, once this uh, opens up, we'll rotate it on the x-axis like everything else, 90 degrees, scale it up. Oh, by the way, too, if, if we move through the scene here, notice on my uh, x-ray uh, object, you can see that once I get into a position where I'm looking at the other side of the normals, or it's reflecting on itself, that the uh, alpha transparency begins to break down. Um, that is another limitation. There's no good workaround for that, okay? It, you know, this is kind of a, a place where we run into a dead end, and you're just going to have to work around these limitations in the way that you set up your scenes. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're using alpha transparency that images don't double back on themselves, because there really is nothing you can do about it. Uh, you're going to run into those sorts of problems, okay? Uh, so that is, a, that is a, a limitation that we can't contend with. But you know what? So far, so good. I think we've dealt with quite a few big problems uh, so far. So uh, just be aware of that one. I don't have an answer for that. Um, this is common in even some other compositors too. So uh, just be aware uh, that whenever you're using these image planes that you want to be looking at them head on even when you're displacing them. Okay, so I imported my streak. I'm going to move my streak all the way to the back. Uh, put this way back here. Now, <clears throat> I've already talked about draw order issues uh, with, uh, with respect to the uh, time, uh, the order in which you, we create these objects. And I've talked about the x-ray uh, setting, uh, and that that will buck the draw order. And we've already put one x-ray image in here. Now the cool thing is that within these different types of blending modes, such as the x-ray, the draw order applies within all, in, uh, all objects that are using that same mode. Meaning that this, uh, the, the next object that I create with an x-ray will shine through everything in the scene, including the objects that were made prior to it using x-ray as well. You follow what I'm saying? So now that I've created this after my uh, smoke, uh, if I apply x-ray to this as well, it will 
shine through everything else when I click on the camera. You can see it back there. It shines through. It works right through everything else. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my streak. I'm going to size it up quite a bit. Uh, we can't really see it uh, through the uh, alpha here when we're clicking on it. You might, you might find that you want to disable some objects just so you can see uh, temporarily. Just turn it off in the viewport. We'll scale this up uh, to about the size we want it to be. This is way in the back of our scene. And uh, I'm going to go to the game engine again. We'll play this gag uh, another time here. And I'm going to set it to uh, add. We're not going to set it to multiply. We're going to use the uh, colors that are already in it. And I'll just kind of position this in space uh, in a place where it just looks like it fits. Now, if I'm using my rule of thirds, uh, I would want to put it probably somewhere around here. And the last one, I put it up here or maybe up here or, you know, it's offset. Uh, uh, on the X and Y axis to kind of a place where, uh, you know, a third of the image would intersect with a third of the image uh, on the X and Y axis. X and Y meaning from our point of view, or X and Z from the point of view of the world. Okay, uh, and maybe I'll scale it down just a little bit from there. All right. So now if I click on Only Renter and I click on the camera view and let me enable my 3D smoke again up here, you see we've got a scene put together. You know, this is pretty good. Uh, you could actually start rendering from here and set up a camera move and, and be golden. We're going to add a couple more things to this uh, and also talk about how we can do some color grading as well, and then we'll be done. This is a really long uh, tutorial, I understand that, but we're covering a lot of content here with respect to uh, alpha transparency and draw order. All right. uh, that will help us in the subsequent tutorials after this. Uh, so the next thing, let's add, uh, let's add in here a glimmer in the background. You saw that on the original uh, video that we had this uh, glimmering going on. If I go back to that, play through it, you can see uh, in the background we have on this flare we have these light rays kind of glimmering. So we want to we want to generate that in some way. So we're going to add another image plane. Uh, import images as planes, and uh, in the same pack, we're going to find an image that looks like this, Glimmer 2, which kind of has a hole in the center of it. Click on that, and again, our setting should be the same. Give it a second. We're going to rotate on the x-axis, 90 degrees, uh, scale it way up, and we're going to change our uh, blend mode to add again and we're going to use uh, this to uh, texture to multiply because we want to change the color and the luminance so we'll set this to multiply we'll go to the material settings so change our color uh, set the intensity all the way up change our color kind of to an orangey looking color maybe somewhere around here and we'll take the uh, luminance way down it's a subtle effect we don't want it to be overbearing almost almost imperceivable okay and we'll take this now and we're going to slide it back uh, to where the other image is at now the quick way to do this is to select our other image uh, streak and we'll go to object settings we'll hit a snap cursor to selected and then we'll click on the um, glimmer image and we'll go to object and we'll hit uh, snap uh, selection to cursor and uh, back here what I want to do is I'm just going to move it slightly behind the other image okay so it's slightly behind it in uh, Y space that way we won't have any draw order issues we'll go back to the camera view and uh, I'm going to turn off my streak real quick, and I'll turn off my 3D smoke so I can see back there. Select the glimmer, scale it up. Uh, click on my camera, make sure we can see it. You can see it in there. See, there's our glimmer. We want to make it pretty big. Um, that's probably big enough. Now, what I'm going to do with the glimmer is I'm going to add uh, I'm going to add some animation. So I want my uh, project to be 120 frames long, no longer than that. 
And at the beginning, I'm going to, uh, with my glimmer selected, I'll hit I, I'll put in scaling. I'll go to the end, and I'll click on I, and I'll add another scaling keyframe. Then I'm going to go to the graph editor. I'm going to click on scaling, and on the X and Y scaling, I'm going to add a modifier. I'm going to add a noise modifier. Now, because this is way far away, find my X here, because it's really big and really far away, I need this, this noise to be huge. It's going to be pretty big. So we're going to bump it way up to 100, because again, it's really far away, so we need to, you know, a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of noise is going to get us very little result. Uh, so let's uh, let's try that, and then I'll click on the y-axis, and I'll just add noise. And we want to make sure that this setting here and this one are the same on both of them, uh, because we don't want uh, the scale and the phase to be different. We want the noise to be exactly the same. Okay, so all these settings want to be the same, 100 here. And we'll go back to the 3D viewport, click on the camera. And if we hit play, we should see this thing kind of flickering. You see how it's flickering a little bit back there? Okay, so that's uh, that's what we're looking for. As the camera moves in our scene, we want to see that flicker. All right. So we'll turn on the uh, streak again. Now we can see the streak adds on to this uh, flickering image in the background. You can see that hopefully on your uh, screen moving around. Very subtle effect. It adds a whole lot. And now we can turn on our 3D smoke and we see everything here. Okay. So now at this point we could uh, animate our camera or we could one up even further and add a couple more effects. I want to add two more things. We're going to add um, a vignette. Again, we could add a vignette later on, but we want to have as much in the scene as possible. Okay. The more elements that we can get into the scene, the less we have to do in post-processing. So let's add one more thing here, uh, vignette. I'm going to, whoops, wrong thing. File, import, images as planes. And uh, we're going to go to a texture that I use a lot. A lot of people would look at this and tell me this is not how you're supposed to create a vignette. I don't care. It still creates a vignette. I made this image in GIMP a while back. Uh, and it's just a, gr a gradient, uh, an oval gradient that goes from transparent in the center to, uh, you know, a charcoal black still with some transparency on the outside edges. So it's a vignette of sorts. I have two of them. I have a really, really stark one and then this one here that's darker on the corners but much more transparent in the center. So you can make one of these in GIMP, transparent with a uh, black gradient. We'll import this. Uh, and uh, again, this is where this is going to matter. Check this out. This image is using transparency. This is the first image that we're using that actually uses alpha transparency. It's in the texture, okay? So this is the first time when this is really going to matter. Shadeless, use alpha, alpha mode, straight. Okay, we want to use straight transparency. So I'll import this image. And this is kind of using a different blend mode from everything else. So uh, we might be able to, whoops, let me do something here real quick. Uh, I forgot that we had snapped our cursor back there. We're going to snap our cursor to center, select my vignette, and we'll snap the object uh, selection to cursor. Now it's back here. Okay, we put it way back there in space. We're going to rotate on the x-axis. What we're going to do, because this is using a different kind of blend mode, it's using alpha transparency, real alpha transparency, not the add blend mode. Uh, this may actually work in our scene without being in the proper draw order, okay, because it's using a different type. I'm going to parent this right to the camera. The vignette is part of the camera. It's part of uh, what the camera lens is doing. So go to the camera view. Got my vignette here. Uh, we'll move it back. I'm actually going to move it way back into the uh, lens of the camera, way back here, right into the bounds of the camera, rather. Go to the camera view, and we will uh, move it up so it's dead center, right in the middle. I'm going to scale it down so that it fits and, you know, we can scale this for more or less of a vignette. Uh, if I was using this image in a compositor, I would change the opacity of it. And here, because it's a gradient, if I want more of a vignette, I can scale it so it meets the bounds of the camera tight. Or if I want less of a vignette, I can just scale it up so it's using less of the gradient. Okay, so we're, we're really using this as a three-dimensional object in order to cre create this uh, optical effect, right? So now if I select on the camera, we can see if our opacity works. It does. 
If I click on only render, we can see that everything shows up in there. Uh, just to be certain, if I uh, turn off the vignette, we should notice that nothing disappears or reappears inside the scene. Uh, and it doesn't, so it means that everything is working. And uh, now if we render one image, we can see that everything is rendering perfectly correct. And uh, we now have a vignette in there. Now let's add one more thing. Uh, we'll, we'll add one more thing here. Uh, if we have a light in here, a big uh, flare, an, uh, uh, an anamorphic kind of flare, we might want to have some lens grit illuminated. So let's add another image. So you see, in all of this, we've only had to reset our draw order a couple of times. And because we've grouped things together smartly and we've organized things, uh, we've only had to do it a few times rather than, uh, you know, working with every single object. Uh, let's add another image. Go to File, Import, Images as Planes. I'm going to go back to my Lens Flare Rig Elements. This, again, was in the GL Flares Pack uh, 2. And uh, in here, there's some Lens Grit elements. So I'm going to select this one here, Lens Grit 2. Import it, rotate on the x-axis 90 degrees. I'm going to bring it back to the camera, and we're going to parent it to the camera. And I want this to shine through my um, vignette, okay? If you look, go back to our camera view, if I, if I turn this lens grit off for a second, you can, actually I don't even need to do that. You can see that my light is shining through the vignette because it is an x-ray object and the vignette's just a transparent object. Um, that's what I want. I want my light, my flare elements to shine through the vignette. The vignette is kind of decided by the lens itself, but so is the flare elements. That is also determined by the lens. And uh, these two things uh, uh, do not necessarily affect each other, meaning that the vignette, we don't want the vignette taking away from the luminance of the flare or the uh, lens grit. We want uh, the lens grit to stand out in front of the vignette. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my lens grit and scale it down here and uh, make it fit my image closer. I'm going to set this also to x-ray so that it will show through my vignette, okay? Uh, and, and it also shows through my flare in the background, which is appropriate, because this is the last light effect that exists in the camera. It's in front of the light source itself, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, we're in the uh, game engine, and I'm going to change this to uh, the add mode again, like I did for my other elements in the background. Give it one second. And we'll come down here, add, and I want to use the uh, texture to multiply into a different color. So I'll go up here to my colors. We've, again, a lot of replication, duplication. Turn up the intensity. Uh, I'm going to make this bright white and make it a bluish tint. Bluish tint like that. And what I'm going to do is we want this to be illuminated. If I select my camera, we'll make sure it's working properly. Yep, everything's on. I want this to be illuminated only in one place. I don't want it to be illuminated through the entire lens. Okay, so this is, you know, really muddy. I want to only see a little bit of lens grit. Now, there's two ways to look at this. We could have the lens grit illuminated around the flare, or we could kind of break the physical laws and be a little more aesthetic and make the um, lens grit be illuminated opposite of the flare. I'm going to go with the latter because I want to see the shimmering in the background. I want to get a good look at this flare. So we want to illuminate this corner up here. So we're going to do another trick that we'll talk about a whole lot more later on uh, in another tutorial, but we're going to create... Uh, what I call a light mask. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another object. I'm going to add a light. Up to this point, we haven't used any lights. Everything is shadeless. I'm going to add one point light to the scene. Now, the point light is going to make things render a little bit slower. Only a little bit. Once it loads in, it's, it, it'll run pretty quick. I'm going to parent my point light to the camera. Okay, so it's going to be part of the camera group. Uh, then I'm going to change my settings on my point light. I'm going to enable sphere. So it's going to make a spherical boundary on my point light so that the light will fall off 
to an edge. And I'm going to make that edge 0 0.5 for right now. We're going to take it down really super tiny, really small. Okay. So you'll see what happens is once this goes into effect, you'll see the bounds of this light are really tight in there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this light forward uh, into the camera space. And right up near, let me get my bearing straight here, uh, line view, view selected. I want to get this up kind of in the plane of my lens grit. Okay, so it's kind of sitting in the same plane. Now, I'm going to select my lens grit, and in the material slot, I'm going to add another material. I'll go to Blender Render, because I'm going to need to use the uh, node editor here in a second. And to this, I'm going to add another material material slot and in this new material I'm going to change the um, shader from Lambert to Fresnel and I'm going to put the intensity all the way up to the top I'm going to turn off the specularity and I'm going to make it absolute white okay and I'm going to name this material. You'll see what we're doing with this in a second. I'm going to call this Light Mask. Okay? Light Mask. We're going to use this as a mask. Uh, we're going to actually generate a three-dimensional volumetric mask. Okay? And this mask is going to illuminate the section of the lens grit that we want to have shining uh, in our camera. Okay? So now, here's what we need to do. We'll select on our first material, Lens Grit. And under the material slot, I'm going to click on the Use Shader uh, Nodes. Okay, Automatically, it's going to make our material disappear because we have to program that material into the uh, node for that. So I'll, I'll open up another window here, and I'll click on the Node Editor. And we're going to open up uh, that material, which was Lens Grit 2. So I'll find it here real quick. Lens Grit 2 it should be darkened out. Now our... our uh, image comes back you can see that there and I'm going to add another material to this we will add uh, an input node a material input node and this material is going to be the light mask material now let me tell you something this material is not unique to this object I could add this same material to any object and then using lights anywhere in the scene can affect any object in this exact same way. Okay, So once you make this one material you can just use it over and over again for any other object that you like. Um, Alright, so I have my new material in here. This, this is a light accepting material. This is not a shadeless material. The lens grit is a shadeless material, but this is not. Okay, I'm going to add here a color uh, mix RGB and on the top, I'm going to put a black color, absolute black. And on the bottom, I'm going to plug in my lens grit. Okay. And uh, we're going to leave it on mix. And I'm going to take my material, uh, my uh, uh, light mask material, and I'm going to plug that into the factor. Now, if we look at the camera view, look what's happening. We're done with the material at this point. If we look at the camera view, you can see what's happening. My light, see my point light down here, wherever I move it, it is now illuminating my material and bringing it out. Okay, So I can indicate where I want, in fact, if I turn on the only render, you can see it a lot better. I can indicate where I want this uh, lens grit to be illuminated. So I want it to be kind of in the opposite corner here. So we'll go to this side and maybe I want the uh, energy to be a little bit higher so I'll turn my energy up to 2 on my point light give it a second you can see it pops out just a little bit more okay so I'll move maybe my point light up a little bit so there's a little bit more fall off there okay maybe I'll bring it back down to 1 again that might be a little bit, a bit too aggressive here on the edge There we go. Okay, so now I get a little bit of a lens grit effect out there. I might actually want to go to my lens grit um, material and change the color. Uh, now, the problem here is that I can't change my color unless I pull it off of the node. So you pull the node off real quick, and then you can change the uh, diffuse color. I think I want it to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more white in it, not, not so blue. kind of blends in with the uh, nebula when it's too blue. 
Okay, so now if I go back up here, and as soon as I click on the Use Nodes, it will automatically go back. There we go. Okay, so here's my scene. Uh, now the last thing I have to do here is to select on the camera, and we'll just add a quick camera move. So uh, I'll uh, where I'm at right now, I'll click uh, hit I, and I'll put in Location Rotation. I'll go to the end. Uh, we'll move forward on the uh, Y axis, G, Y. Move it forward just a little bit. Maybe I'll move... Uh, uh, See if we can move on the x-axis, maybe a little bit to the right. And uh, I'll rotate it on the z-axis just a little bit. And I'll uh, input a location rotation. And if we come back, we have our camera move. Now, I, I want this to not have an f-curve on it, so we'll just go to the um, uh, graph editor, and I'll hit V, and then I'll select vector for the keyframe handling and it will make a, a straight shot uh, point to point move here. If I go back to my 3D view and we hit play we can see that things are moving now in three dimensional space. Now at this point you would want to tweak it a little bit, maybe move some things in three dimensional space and get the most uh, the maximum motion out of it. Like I notice right now my um, uh, stars are not quite uh, parallax, it's not quite enough parallax going on in the background, okay? I'm not going to mess with that right now, but that's what you would want to do. You could go into your 3D scene and things are separated far enough right now that you could just kind of move a few things in space and get everything organized the way you want it and uh, you know tweak tweak your project okay so you could render this out right now and be done um, we're going to we're going to uh, uh, one up this uh, once again and add a little bit more uh, uh, finesse to this so uh, I want my render settings to be HD uh, 1080p my final output is going to be 720 HD um, now here's why I'm going to add another scene new scene in the new scene I'm going to add a camera and on this camera, I'm going to make it, uh, there's a preset here, HDTV 720p. Uh, I'm going to go back to my first scene. Uh, we'll let it load into the OpenGL render engine view camera. And uh, I'm going to go to the video editor, video sequence editor, and I'm going to, in the video sequence editor, select scene one, my new scene. Okay, So this is the new scene. And uh, if I click on default, I should automatically go back to my regular scene. So that's why I did that in this order. Okay, so we can jump back and forth here. Uh, up here, I'm going to get out of the graph editor. We're not going to use that really for anything. I'm going to click on the properties uh, settings here. This is 720p. My original scene is 1080p. Here's why I did this. The Blender OpenGL GLSL engine will... Uh, do anti-aliasing. You can find that up here, by the way, in the Render uh, tab and come down to OpenGL Render uh, Settings and click on anti-aliasing. You can set your samples here, right? Change your alpha mode here, sky or transparent. This is just kind of quick settings, okay? Uh, right now we want it on sky because we're using the black background. Um, anti-aliasing does not work in the video sequence editor when you're using scenes, okay? It doesn't work. So if you've ever imported scenes as strips, which is what we're going to do, we're going to use the OpenGL preview, it won't do anti-aliasing. You'll get very blocky, a, a very blocky outcome. Now, here's, here's another hack, major hack, okay? Blender isn't intended to do this, but it does do it. It up-converts and down-converts images so that they fit the composition size. So right now we have 1280 by 720. So anything we put in here, no matter the size, will be up-converted or down-converted to 1280 by 720. Which means that if I add my scene in, scene, not scene one, but scene, uh, and I change my OpenGL preview to texture, my 1080p scene will be down-converted to fit 720 HD. Okay, uh, let me change my composition size here to 120, so we have the right number of frames. Now this is a benefit, because, because it does this, it is sort of forcing an anti-aliasing practice to occur. Okay, you see it's not blocky. It should be blocky, but it isn't blocky, especially if you have uh, solid objects in there. 
because it's down converting, it interpolates all the pixels and comes up with a new pixel arrangement. It interpolates pixels together so that it can be down converted or up converted as the case may be uh, to generate the new aspect ratio and the new resolution. And that, in essence, is anti-aliasing. That's exactly what it's doing. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn close. It's close enough that in the interest of hacking the viewport, uh, it does exactly what we want to do. Okay, so by having a higher resolution in the scene and then the lower resolution HD here, uh, I can get the uh, uh, anti-aliasing in the uh, video sequence editor. And this is very important when using perhaps objects that are in separate scenes and compositing separate layers, which is something we'll probably do later on. Uh, you want things to be uh, blended together seamlessly and cleanly without uh, that blockiness. Okay, so um, that's something that we want to do. All right. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, just so we can move quicker, I'm going to turn this uh, to no display for the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of a motion blur. We're going to, this is the next hack, okay? We're going to do poor man's motion blur. We're going to interpolate our frames. Now, if you really want to do motion blur, I'm going to double, uh, by the way, what I'm doing here is I duplicated my scene, and I'm going to move it uh, to the left one frame to zero. So now this top scene is occurring one frame ahead of the bottom scene. And uh, the way the stack works is that things that are on top are composited over things that are on the bottom. Okay, so it's layered from bottom to top. Uh, in here, I'm going to set my opacity to 0 0.1, so very low opacity. Uh, but this will be one frame ahead of the other one. Okay, we're going to interpolate the frames here from the previous frame to the second frame. Now, real sample motion blur does subframes. So there's actually frames in between the frames, and there's a number of samples. You can set the samples in motion blur to do that, to do five samples or 10 samples or 16 or 32 samples. The higher the samples, the better the blur. We're going to cheat this, and we're going to use the frames that we have already. Now, I could render the whole thing out from the viewport and oversample it, uh, changing the uh, uh, these settings here, uh, the end frame and the time remapping to generate subsamples, and then I can change uh, the speed in here. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to do this the simplest way, the poor man's way. Because it's a slow move, we can get away with this, okay? So let me duplicate this again. I'm going to move it up one more, and I'm going to move this one to the right one frame. So this is starting on frame two, and uh, I'll just move my cursor ahead so when we turn this on, you'll see what's happening. I'm going to set the opacity to 0 0.2, and I'm really going to step out of the bounds here. We're going to go another frame to the right, so we're really way outside the bounds. But I'm going to set this opacity super low, 0 0.08. It's not even uh, 0.1, but 0 0.08. Okay, so it's, you almost can't even see it. But there'll be enough color in there that it will add kind of a blurring effect for the motion. All right? So if I turn my display back on now, uh, scene render size, you'll see what's happened. We now have, uh, you, you can't even really see it that well, okay? So if it's an effect that you can't see well, then it's a good effect. Uh, let me find a place up here. If I turn this off, and then I turn the next one off, and I turn the next one off, you can see how sharp this is. Right, and this is something close to the camera that's moving. So I'll turn them on now. So the second one, turn it on. Next one, turn it on. You can see how it's starting to blur, right? And I turn the next one on. Now the only things that are going to blur are the things that are moving close to the camera. Things that are far away in space are going to be pretty clear, just like real motion blur. Things that aren't moving are sharp. Things that are moving have blur in in the direction in which they're moving. Okay, so poor man's motion blur interpolation. Right. Um, like I said, I could have rendered this directly from the uh, viewport if I wanted to. I could just click on the uh, video render, set my output, render this whatever resolution I want. But we're going to one up it. Okay, we're going to go one one step further. So back to the video editor. I'm going to add now do some color grading. So I'll add here uh, an effect strip, and we'll add an adjustment layer. And you could render it right now if you want without uh, adding this in. Um, but we're just going to you know use the tools we have available to us. So. Uh, adjustment layer, we're going to come down here. I'm going to take some of the saturation out, 0 0.9. And uh, we're going to add a curves adjustment. And I told you at the beginning of this, you never want to have absolute black. And we do have some absolute black in there, especially with the vignette added in. So I'm going to click on the uh, darks end on the color curve and bump it up a couple steps. So it'll get more of a gray color. <coughs> I'm going to click on the highs. We don't want absolute white either. 
I'm going to step it back just one. I'm going to go to the blues, and I'm going to ever so subtly bump up the low end. Only a little bit. I'm going to go to the high end and bring it down below the, the uh, natural curve. I'm going to go to the reds, and I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to bump up the top end. I'm going to go to the lows. I'm going to bump down the low end. So things that are black are going to have a little bit more blue tint. Things that are bright are going to have a little bit more of a red contrast tint. Now I'll go to the greens, and it'll bring up the middles of the greens. Just a little touch like that. Okay. So mid-tones will be a little bit green. High tones will be a little red. Low tones will be a little bit blue. I'm going to go to the outside edges on the green. I'm going to bump them down a couple. So it really brings out the blues and the reds a little bit more. Bring up my greens a little bit more in the middle. Ever so slightly. Okay. Then I'll go to my um, color, uh, the, the main one here, the uh, luminance. And we'll add uh, the slightest amount of contrast, just a tiny, tiny bit. So it makes it look like our dynamic range is a little bit further than what it really is. We're faking it. Okay. So to, to see what it is, if I turn this adjustment layer off, you'll see what it was and what it is now. A little bit more dynamic. A little bit more dynamic. Okay, that's what color grading does. Is it gets us to set the tone exactly right. And uh, you know what? I'm going to bring my... Um, uh, I want to bring my uh, saturation back. So I'm going to add another adjustment layer above this. And what it will do is it will apply to everything below it. And uh, I'm just going to hit the saturation, bump it up to 1.2, and it will make all these colors that we just created pop out even more, okay? So if you look close, we don't have an absolute black in there, okay? That's good. We don't want absolute black. We don't have an absolute white in there either, okay? Uh, and that actually generates the uh, essence of a wider dynamic range, even though there isn't one. Now we're ready to go. We can render from this point. And uh, it's been sitting on this frame, so if I hit the OpenGL Render button, you'll see it renders super quick. Now, it, you can see what the render time will be Excuse me for a second. If I set my output, set it to uh, AVI JPEG, and uh, we'll go to my space textures, and we'll call this test. So I've got my render settings set there. If I start to render this, you'll see how, how uh, slow it's become. It's not quite as fast as the viewport because we've added some effects now. But we're still rendering for the first time. This is not pre-composed or pre-rendered. Okay, This is coming direct to us from the viewport. It's being down-converted to this new resolution that's causing anti-aliasing. We have uh, some effects on here. We've added a, a frame interpolation to get motion blur. Uh, because it's a slow motion, we can get away with this. If it's fast motion, we'd have to do something else, probably oversample it. We've added adjustment layers to get some color grading and saturation. And now we're ready to, to really render out something that's top notch here. So if I click on the render button to render the a single frame, you get one frame. Because it's been sitting here, this frame renders super quick. Okay, It's already been rendered in the view port. Um, if we go to uh, the video renderer, you'll see how slow it is. Okay, so uh, 1001, 1002, 1003, so about two seconds. Two seconds per frame. Um, if you were rendering this from cycles, something like this, or rendering it from the internal render engine, you would be talking about minutes of render time. Minutes of render time rather than seconds, okay? So two seconds of render time is awesome compared to that, especially when we're looking at essentially a full render. Now from this we can do more post-processing effects. We could uh, do some optical effects and change the uh, aspect ratio and the, uh, you know, add a, 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 some sort of a deformation, lens deformation to it or something like that. Um, um, you know, all kinds of things. We could render out separate um, layers uh, from inside of the uh, viewport uh, and then use those separate layers uh, inside of uh, another compositor, right? And we can render our layers in a matter of seconds, uh, uh, minutes and seconds between frames and uh, get to compositing a lot quicker outside. Um, but you see the potential for all of this and how this uh, works out. So already in the time that I've been talking here, we're up to about 20 frames. Uh, and if I go to my uh, folder here, click on our test, we'll see the first uh, second or so of our video. Oh, let me find it here, Starfield. Nope, that's not it. Excuse me as I blunder around for a second. Nebula Project. 
and we'll click on test. Here it is. So here's the first second of video and you can see how everything is coming out. We see that flickering going on in the background. Okay, and the more time you spend on it, the more perfect you can place everything. But um, that's uh, episode number two. This is a really long one. I think a lot of the episodes coming up are going to be much shorter than this. But we covered a lot of ground. We talked about draw order. We talked about different blending modes and how the draw order between blending modes is kind of isolated to those blending modes. We talked about resetting the draw order. We talked about recalibrating it. We talked about grouping uh, images that have been set in a draw order so that we can recalibrate our draw order more efficiently. Uh, we've talked about, um, uh, again, different blend modes in the X-ray and the use of the X-ray blend mode. We've talked a little bit about some animation, about 3D, uh, three-dimensional settings and two-dimensional settings. Uh, we even briefly talked about um, uh, uh, using uh, uh, outside sources such as GIMP or another photo editor, uh, Photoshop or something like that, to generate assets prior to importing. Um, I know some compositors can do that all within. Uh, you know, Blender doesn't do that. Um, Blender does have a paint system that can do some of those things, but, you know, it, it's a small price to pay to prepare some of your assets before you bring them in. Uh, in fact, in a later episode, we'll look a little bit about how we can jump directly to a photo editor outside uh, and use it more seamlessly uh, with uh, Blender itself. But anyway, you know, this is three-dimensional compositing in Blender using the uh, OpenGL capabilities in the viewport. A lot of hacks in there. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully you get something out of this and you can apply some of these things to other very different projects that you're working on. So uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, offer this to you today, and uh, I wish all of you the best of luck and uh, happy blending.